Dr. Danny Wedding, uh, director of the Missouri Institute of Mental Health, and I've been working on the Mr. Fastic project for the past two years with Dr. Stephen Braddock. Steve, I, I know that you're a, a pediatrician, first and foremost, and teach in the University of Missouri at Columbia Child Health Department, mm -hmm. but you're also a geneticist and a dysmorphologist. That's correct. Um, I did my pediatric training out of medical school, and while being a trained to take care of children and their families, the niche that I found that I really enjoyed working with is children who have birth defects, children mm -hmm. with special needs, to try and not only understand for that family what's gone on, why that may have occurred, what the chance that it might happen again is, but also in many instances to try and prevent these things from happening again. And I had an experience early in my residency training where I was working at a, a, a state training school, a school for the severely mentally handicapped, and working with those individuals. And at first, everybody to me seemed like just another client, another patient, and I couldn't really see hide nor hair of what was different about them. But eventually when our dysmorphologist at that institution came down and visited with me and went over the cases, it was somewhat like opening up a whole new novel, a whole book of things. We approached things somewhat like Sherlock Holmes would, looking at each of the clues that we could see and then making deductions about what had occurred and what possibly could have led to that individual's problems. Frequently those were things that nature just did, that we had no choice over. But what I had learned and what was sad is that many of the individuals in there had conditions that could have been prevented. They were mm -hmm. due either to not, not re recognizing a problem shortly after birth, such as with somebody's thyroid gland or, or somebody's mm -hmm. um, uh, m having PKU and getting fed the wrong diet, or sometimes something that the mother was exposed to during pregnancy that could have affected the fetus. And the things that fit into that were alcohol, mm -hmm. um, some other drugs that could be ingested, sometimes prescription medications. And because of that, I started to see an effort that we could really make to try and prevent some of these birth defects, the most common of which, unfortunately, are birth defects due to alcohol, mm -hmm. and hence our involvement together in the, the Mr. Fastac program. Now, that dysmorphologist you referred to was Dr. Ken Jones? Actually, at that time, it was uh, a professor named Dr. John Carey. That okay. was in Utah. And based on my work with mm -hmm. John, uh, with Dr. Carey, I became further interested in looking into the field of genetics and dysmorphology, and that led mm -hmm. to my uh, training in both at UCLA in Los Angeles and then eventually in San Diego with Dr. Ken Jones, uh, Kenneth Lyons-Jones in San Diego, who is the preeminent dysmorphologist in and our I, country. I guess about 30 years ago, Ken Jones discovered fetal alcohol syndrome. Well, I don't know if Ken would say that he discovered it. I think that we have evidence that fetal alcohol s syndrome has been around for eons. Uh -huh. But Ken, when he was himself a fellow with Dr. David Smith at the University of Washington, came upon a series of patients along with their pediatrician, Christy Ulaland, and Dr. Ann Streiskuth, who is a psychologist, mm -hmm. and started to notice a unique pattern of, of physical features in those individuals and realized that all of the mothers of those individuals were alcoholics. Uh -huh. And based upon that, in 1973, they wrote the first paper in the English literature, in the English medical literature, describing what we now know today as the fetal alcohol syndrome. So even though it had been around for thousands of years, it really is only the past 30 years that medical science has documented and cataloged this condition. Um, Steve, do you ever find occasions when, when other pediatricians have missed the diagnosis of FAS or on the other side where they've uh, identified somebody with FAS who didn't have the syndrome? Unfortunately, both of those are very frequent occurrences. Fetal alcohol mm -hmm. syndrome is a very, very common condition affecting about one in 500 children in our country. Mm -hmm. In the state of Missouri, that wow. represents about 150 babies born every year with this condition, and we're a relatively small state. This is a, a chronic problem, and it can be entirely prevented by having women avoid drinking alcohol. Now, a lot of times, physicians, whether they be pediatricians or family practitioners, internists, even mm -hmm. psychiatrists and neurologists, see children who have been affected by alcohol or prenatally affected by alcohol, but either the questions aren't asked or there's not much delving into the issue, and therefore these kids are passed along through the system yeah that by the time they get to me in, in my clinic, you know, they are much further along in their development or lack of development, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. School-aged children having behavior problems, having attention problems and other medical problems that 
we hoped that we could have picked up on much sooner to get them into the appropriate interventions. Okay. Likewise, some physicians label children as oh. having fetal alcohol syndrome or FAST, as, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and based upon a rumor that the mother may have drank during the pregnancy yeah. and not really understanding all the other intricacies of making that diagnosis. But let's remember that this is a clinical diagnosis. There's no blood test to do it. There's no obvious test that we have right now that will pinpoint these. It's based upon physical examination, neurodevelopmental examinations, and to some extent trying to confirm a maternal history of alcohol use or abuse during pregnancy. So it's always a judgment call on the physician's part. It's always a judgment call on the physician's part. And what we see is that some people will get pigeonholed into a label uh, for various reasons. One, because they may be from an ethnic group that fetal alcohol syndrome has been more described in or more mm -hmm. obvious in. Two, because families are trying to get services for their children and having a label attached such as fetal mm -hmm. alcohol syndrome may open up some doors to them for that benefit. Okay. So, so Steve, we've, we've been talking about FAS, but, but can you define it clinically for me and tell me exactly what it is? Sure. What fetal alcohol syndrome is, or to make a diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome, we look at specific things. First of those are particular facial features. The palpebral fissures, or the windows out of our eyes uh -huh. that we look through, are short. Likewise, the area between our nose and our lip is longer and smooth. You don't see... The, some people cover up with mustaches, uh -huh. but you don't see this little divot through the middle, and your yeah. upper lip may be thin. Those are some of the hallmark facial features of fetal alcohol syndrome. The next big area that we look at is growth. Children who are affected by alcohol use in utero tend to be smaller. They tend to have uh, prenatal growth deficiency as well as postnatal growth deficiency. So they start out small, they stay small throughout childhood and into through adolescence. And that's really a hallmark of this. And that's, uh, that lack of growth is both in terms of their height and, more importantly, in their weight. They don't seem to have subcutaneous tissue stores. Yeah. Lastly, the most important part of growth yeah. is their brain. Brains tend to be smaller, and therefore head size tends to be smaller. Steve, I, I know that, that uh, people with FAS uh, go through life with a number of deficits, and the life is sometimes hard. But sometimes do you find that some of the kids with, with FAS grow up and have the capacity to marry, to hold down a job, to have a fairly ordinary life? Clearly they do. And what one considers to be an ordinary life versus others, there's different trials and tribulations we all have to go through, obviously. There are still the same problems, even in adult life, that we see earlier. And a lot of those at that point are no longer physical issues, but they tend to be the, the behavioral issues, the problems we talked about in cognitive functioning, being able to manage one's own finances, being able to remember how to do those things. And problems with judgment, that kind of thing. Judgment problems. Unfortunately, because of the judgment issues, frequently we see these people mm -hmm. ending up in the legal system as well. They have impulsive behaviors, mm -hmm. or they can be easily victimized, so on both sides of that status. Mm -hmm. And that puts people down a different pathway in their lives, too. And that's very unfortunate. And once again, if people don't recognize that they have fetal alcohol syndrome, and it's easy to miss because they look like every other person that you might see going down the street to the naked eye or the un, untrained eye, then they don't get the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. that they have a significant problem with their processing yeah. and they get into those situations. This is different than, for instance, most other genetic syndromes, and not to pick on one group, but for instance, Down syndrome, where mm -hmm. many people, both in the legal system as well as in the lay public, can recognize an adult or a child with Down syndrome, sure. and therefore they see that there are different things that might be causing them to have those same behavior issues. With fetal alcohol syndrome, that's not necessarily true. And that leads to getting between a rock and a hard place. Sure. And there's been many times we've been called from lawyers and judges, from the courts, to try and evaluate, was this person having, does this person have fetal alcohol syndrome, mm -hmm. and how does that impact on what's been going on in their lives? Yeah. Steve, uh, my, my boys are 18 and 21, so uh, they were born about two decades ago, and, and I realized that, that the science had only been out there for about 10 years, but it had been out there. Uh, I remember very distinctly the obstetrician that we worked with telling my wife that uh, having a glass of wine every evening would help her relax when she was pregnant, and, um, and in fact encouraging her to, to, to drink a beer uh, when she was lactating. And yet uh, I know enough now to realize that's, that's terrible uh, advice. 
and yet uh, the, the, the scientific information had been out there for 10 years and the profession hadn't caught up with that. And, and do we still have physicians giving bad advice and, and, and how can that be? Well, it's very frustrating. And, and in 30 years in medicine, you think that the learning curve wouldn't still be so steep, but yeah. clearly it is. And a lot of teaching in medicine occurs what's passed down, sort of like mm -hmm. history telling and storytelling in, in ancient America even. It's and clinical ancient lore. Cultures. It's clinical lore. There's been a lot of times where alcohol has been used mm -hmm. therapeutically throughout history and throughout medical history. We talked to a group of nurses who reminded us that we used to give alcohol to women to stop labor. Sure. And it worked because it relaxed the muscles. Well, what it was also doing is going right across and relaxing the baby so they weren't quite so active. The same thing has happened, you know, in, in terms of getting women to calm down or using this as a therapy for women to calm down and saying, oh, a little bit of alcohol doesn't hurt. Well, if a person has a single glass of wine or a single drink during their pregnancy, I don't think that's probably going to be something associated with a terrible outcome for their baby. However, we don't know a safe amount. Yeah. And the bottom line is no safe amount of alcohol is known. Some people will point to saying that, well, I'm not a chronic alcoholic, and all the pictures and all I hear about with these conditions are children with chronic alcoholics. That's not mm -hmm. necessarily true. But the more severe ones may be do, born to women who are chronic alcoholics, but you're still affecting something every yeah. time you're taking a drink of alcohol, and that is passed directly to your baby. So babies will often be more calm, but it, the reason they are is because they're receiving alcohol directly. And mm -hmm. I don't think anybody would want to suggest that we should just give our children alcohol directly to Surely calm not. them down. Boy. So um, is, is the, uh, the official CDC position that no amount of alcohol is safe? The official position of the CDC and every other organization, right, major organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetrics, is that there is no known safe amount of alcohol. The hard part is we use textbooks and all. We're trying to go through and change all of those mm -hmm. to try and tell people that. We don't want yeah. women feeling guilty because that's not good either. And if you've already had a drink and you realize you're pregnant, that is a lot of stress on the mother as well if you yeah. have this, this concept that you may have just harmed your child. On the other hand, what we want people to do is to realize that they need to cut back or stop drinking mm -hmm. altogether when they're pregnant. And they have no physiologic re reason to need to drink alcohol. It's not a prescription medication sure. that they need yeah. for their own health. And so even if the odds are one in a thousand that something bad would happen, since that bad thing will last for a, a person's entire life, why would anybody take that chance? Exactly. I, I agree with that, and we try to express that to people as much as we can. Okay. Once again, we're talking about a common condition, one in 500 children. Yeah. And most of us can easily name the towns we live in, and there are many more than 500 people. Think, sure. put those into numbers yeah. and, and just play with them. A very interesting uh, occasion happened to me shortly after I came to Missouri about 10 years ago, and I was giving a lecture about fetal alcohol syndrome, and I remember a woman was very quiet in the back of the room, and at the very end she came up to me and she said that she enjoyed hearing my talk and she wished that she had known it many years before because she had worked in a bar. She had been a bartender for years and years. Mm -hmm. And although she never said that she considered herself an alcoholic, she clearly would share drinks with the customers and, yeah. and drink. And her first baby was born, was very small, is, was severely mentally retarded as she got older, and was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome. Mm -hmm. That was devastating to her. Yeah. However, is at that time she started to realize her own alcohol problem too and she quit drinking she quit she was fired from her job at the bar mm -hmm. she got pregnant again had another child who's completely normal yeah. okay who's gone to college she's very proud of her in the interim the the woman was rehired as a bartender and her third child again has fetal okay. alcohol syndrome so proving to her and making her realize at the same time that it was that impact of alcohol and seeing what, when she avoided it, how good things can come. And I'm happy to say that she has since gotten into treatment and she's had no further children, but for her own health, she has done much better as well and realizes where we have come with this and just wishes that we were much harder and louder with this news earlier. But that was at a time that there wasn't much information around. Yeah. We're hoping that projects like Mr. Fastic change all that. We're hoping that projects will change that. We're hoping that we're getting more in individuals out there to run clinics, a multidisciplinary clinic mm -hmm. that can have a pediatrician or developmental pediatrician, a primary care provider, 
a dysmorphologist or geneticist involved, a psychologist, social workers, and even, and perhaps most importantly, parent advocates, uh -huh. people who can steer you down the right path in your community to get the services that you need to make sure that this doesn't fall through. And we're starting one of these after Mr. Fastak. We've started one of these here in the state of Missouri. There are other clinics around various states. And I think that it's a really important thing to try and really head into this project, to head into the problem and head it off now while we can still make a good difference. Okay. Well, Steve, I'm excited by the project. I've enjoyed working with you on it. Uh, as you know, this particular segment of our CD-ROM is, is aimed at those physicians who are participating in the training we do. And do you have any summary comment for your fellow physicians? What I really want pediatricians to know and to realize is to be aware of fetal alcohol syndrome and don't be afraid to ask the questions. You have children in your clinics that will have this condition, but they may not be diagnosed just by lack of investigation. If you don't feel comfortable with the diagnosis or making diagnoses of fetal alcohol syndrome, please refer to, to a clinic or to a professional in your area that can do that. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure having you on today, and thanks for everything, Thank Steve. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure.